as I read these very interesting papers, as you've heard, I began to realize that uh, my first reaction to them was similar to the reaction I've been having to my assistant who's been trying to push the academic office and make it paperless. And it has caused me tremendous anxiety for more than a year. When I ask her for a file and she always tells me it's in Dropbox and I can't imagine what I'm going to do if I can never find Dropbox. <laughs> and I began to think how these papers are really talking about the same kinds of anxieties that are produced in communities of faith when, but when they have to do with the challenges of this new technology that in many ways challenge core Christian beliefs that really have to do with identity and saying who is Christian and who is it that we are as a community. I looked for common threads in the papers because they were so distinct and so very interesting. And I found a particular one that I, I think is crucial to what I want to say today in my response. And that is something that Catherine begins to, 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 uh, to highlight, and it is the need to have an ethical evaluation of what goes on with technology. And I want to focus on that. I want to really hold that as my response. And she writes, does the new ability to connect across face-to-face and mediate, mediated interactions engender Christian values of peace, patience, honesty, justice, humility, and love. And then Jason asks, how can we use technology to love God and neighbor more? And Verity asks and says that it is necessary for the church to say something about the potential for both good and evil in their communities. I think that this ethical focus and the need for the community of faith for the church to look at what, are the, what, what does it imply, what, are, what, do these, what does this life, this virtual life really mean and how is it, uh, it, how is it, it, it kind of moving out into the world is important for us today. And I, I want to, to say that while the papers focused on what could be considered orthodox Christian beliefs such as sacraments or trinity or incarn incarnation, I want to ask the question of what happens and how does one engage the growing and expanding religious communities that do not hold these same doctrinal beliefs? What do we do with those that are barely Christian or not even Christian, that are, that are also making claims to truth and are also living in this, rich, in this virtual space. Verity makes more explicit an important idea that I think that Catherine and Jason probably would agree with as, would agree with as well. Verity says in her paper, creating Christian community requires not just new and effective tools, but also knowledge of the content of faith. My question is, how is this knowledge of the content of faith, of faith transmitted via social media and who is responsible for putting together the content? The question relates directly to my, my unease about so much information on the web about Christianity that would not be considered orthodox, that does not value sacraments, or that promotes consumerism and material wealth as evidence of God's favor and as evidence of being Christian. How does a pastor help the members of her or his congregation learn to discern the powers and principalities that inhabit social media and that run contrary to many biblical beliefs that accord to Christianity. I have been researching and teaching and writing about the prosperity gospel for a few years now, and I really do believe that the prosperity gospel poses a great challenge to many of the doctrines and essential orthodox Christian beliefs shared by these authors and by so many others in the church today which then only complicates what this all means for social media itself. If there is any group today calling itself Christian that is also very savvy about the use of social media to promote its message, it would be many of the primary and successful prosperity gospel preachers who market themselves today. The great problem I see is that these figures pose, that these figures pose to mainline Christian communities, whether Protestant or Roman Catholic, is that they draw from very deep and embedded ideologies that are part and parcel of US culture and society. And the same way that we cannot be other than embodied, these communities are also embodying a very real social and cultural worldview that challenges these basic and orthodox Christian beliefs. 
So can churches today, particularly pastors, who oversee or, pro or provide the content of social media for their own congregations, really counteract what is a very strong ideal in this nation today, the ideal of wealth and health as indicators of God's favor. In the 2006 Time Magazine, when in 2006 Time Magazine conducted a national poll and found that 17% of Christians surveyed belonged to a prosperity gospel movement. 61% surveyed say they believed in a God who wants people to be prosperous. And 31% say, said that they believed that if you gave your money to God, God will bless you with more money. I think that if we are to follow Bart's advice to preach with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other, as Jason reminds us, in this case today it is to preach with an open computer in the other or a phone, then the very critical issue of economics must be a part of the analysis and ethical evaluation that we also make of the web and of all of the social media. It is precisely because social media is inherently progressive and because it can level the playing field between the haves and the have-nots where the excluded are now able to connect. And an analysis of how ideas about money impact not only the content of what churchgoers in particular and people in general read in, or listen to or are exposed to in social media, but they also continue to reinforce these same ideas that help to create a very individualistic, materialistic, consumer-driven understanding of the relations between God and humans. And I believe that the greatest challenge is that these ideas now so prevalent in social media about money and wealth are really part of the DNA of this nation. All of us here are aware that Christianity has indeed through the centuries made use of various ways to communicate and reach out to create not only community, but to promote identity and teach a theology. This has been especially true in the United States. We find in the great urban revivals, and we heard from, uh, from the professor who was talking about Whitfield, but we find in Whitfield, an early figure, but also in the urban revivals of Moody and Finney and Billy Sunday, how valuable broadcast media was to promote their evangelistic efforts. But more than that, how these notable and respected evangelists used broadcast media of their day, making them part of entertainment and pop culture. The history of Christianity in the United States also teaches us that as media changed in its form and as technology advanced, it was quickly embraced by the new and rising religious leaders. We heard from one professor how the whole issue with radio, right? And he talked about Amy McPherson. And Amy McPherson actually bought a radio station in northern Mexico because she wanted access to broadcast media. She wanted to go out there. So in the 1920s, she buys this radio station in northern Mexico, making her someone who was able to reach out much, way, much broader than she was reaching out to, and to the, uh, than the folks in the Angelus Temple. And she was specifically dealing with the issues of the day, which were prohibition and Darwinism. Because of, she, because of, of this movement, we see that, in her, that she is followed two decades later in the 1940s by Oral Roberts, who comes on the scene claiming direct and personal communication with God that was revealed in a healing ministry that helped them to reach millions of people in their own homes. Television made Roberts and all those who came after him an easily recognizable media figure, but also one that television viewers intimately connected with as they sat in the privacy of their home. This embrace of technology by these early evangelists to promote their message really helped to make religion a product of the market for public consumption that is still alive and well in today's social media. Each one of these people, whether Whitfield, Finney, Moody, McPherson, Roberts, uh, Oral Roberts, not only continued to shape Christianity in the United States, but they also introduced a new theological worldview, a new ecclesiology, a new pneumatology, a new way to understand God and relate to God that I think that these papers highlighted. It's helped pushing us to think about how these doctrines now are expanded as every generation that uses media, what they're doing to these ideas. But even more than that, they also showed how profitable it was to package and market their kind of Christianity. Their savvy use of broadcast media from early newspapers to radio to television and now through social media today embodied by Joel Olstein or T.D. Jakes or Joyce Myers or Creflo Dollar have helped to make religion a commodity of values and ideas that has little to do with incarnation, 
sacrament, or trinity. In my research, I have been focusing on La Misión Carismática Internacional, the International Charismatic Mission, founded in 1983 in Colombia, Bogota, commonly known as the G12 movement, which, come, which uh, is now claims to have over, over one million members. I was able to attend the 2009 annual convention of the G12, which was held in Miami Beach, and it became clear that the G12 movement is not only about, is not, is not about sacraments, not about symbols that transmit a faith. Instead, it is about how it is possible to tap into a diverse source of material blessing made manifest when that Christian achieves the means to become a consumer in the fullest sense of the word. And I have to tell you, if you go online, they have their just amazing, all of the things that you could do with their website, all of the ways that they connect to all of the just different communities in different languages. Uh, the, to the G12, we can add La Iglesia Universal del Reino de Dios, which is the Universal Church of the Kingdom of God, founded in Brazil in 1977, believed to have 12 million members worldwide. And you can found it, find it also in most US cities with large concentrations of Brazilians. To this we add the Yodo Full Gospel Church founded in 1981, the largest church in Korea with over a million members. And in Nigeria, we find the Redeemed Christian Church of God led by Pastor Enoch Adeboye, who was named one of the 50 global elites by Newsweek, a man of great political and economic influence who can be heard in, many of the, in any of the many YouTube sermons online. It seems to me that an examination of what is happening today in social media and its impact on Christianity and congregations must take into account and must carefully examine the impact of these powerful and very public prosperity gospel neo-Pentecostal preachers whose influence is also present in the US today, whether in the Latino communities in Miami or Los Angeles, as well as in New York or in the large Nigerian and Ghanaian communities found right here in Brooklyn and the Brazilian communities of Boston. I think that what I want to really focus on is to, to ask the question of, as we talk this Christian talk, as we talk about doctrines, as we talk about these ideas that are so embedded in, in the orthodox sense of Christianity, how do we then evaluate and look at these other groups as well? How do we look at these international movements that use social media to connect to its constituents and to attract new followers. Cesar Castellanos in Colombia, David Yogi Cho, founder of the Full Gospel Church in Korea, Edir Macedo, founder of the Universal Church of the Kingdom of God in Brazil, Carlos Cash Luna, founder of La Casa de Dios in Guatemala, Enoch Adeboye in Nigeria have become the new voices the new faces of the non-English speaking prosperity ideal. But here is the twist. Prosperity gospel is a US product. And as Jim Wallace argues, perhaps one of America's biggest exports in the 20th and 21st century is the prosperity gospel. However, what is more important to us to keep in mind today is that once exported outside of the US borders, they are returning home. And in the case of Cesar Castellanos, they are impacting US Latino church by encouraging a bloated, conspicuous consumerism that cannot be sustained by the thousands of Latinos and Latina converts who live in economically marginalized communities. That is why I agree with Verity when she writes in her paper, social forces that impact the ways in which Christian communities are shaped and function are particularly interesting and ripe for theological reflection. And a social force that cannot be overlooked when critically examining social media and theology is certainly the prosperity gospel precisely because its roots lie in US Christianity. And in a particular reading of the Bible found by, found by some Christian preachers who, also, who are, were also the first to use broadcast media and today continue to use social media. The personal riches the idea that personal riches become a mark of individual achievement for the non-believer and a mark of God's favor for many Christians is important to keep in mind as we think about who is it that we're talking about in this Christian community. But what is even more interesting to me is that when the theological idea was exported to the global south, it took on a new significance, especially for economically marginalized communities 
that can today, that today have migrated and can be found in any of the large urban centers of this nation. Because I agree when Verity says, Christians have something to say about the potential for good and evil in their communities, it is my hope that this new media project will help to really create a conversation that will think critically and, think and begin to think ethically about those who are part of the Christian community, whether we want them or not, groups that we have created that are a US phenomenon and that now are impacting what is going on in our racial ethnic communities. I hope that this project can really move us to a conversation with, ch with church leaders and with, and with organizations and institutions like Union, with students and professors to think about how is it that we can provide an ethical response to these kind of teachings that really end up hurting our communities, especially our racial ethnic communities. The prosperity gospel in its current form today must be critically examined so that the ethical evaluation of social media that Catherine calls for extends beyond the theological orthodox Christian communities and ideas and doctrines and also includes those who are on the theological margins but whose market power and social influence cannot be ignored. Thank you. <laughs>